<coughs> Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. We also have a Telegram group. You can join this group to access all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures is available and have master in integration key which coordinates the PDF as well as the YouTube. These are the disclaimers and we are in phase three which is recorded pathology lectures and today we are with Pursue 7ZB1 which is neuropathology and we are dealing with miscellaneous tumors of CNS and to talk on that we have Dr. Shristi Bhutta who is an MBBS honors gold medalist MD in pathology presently as a demonstrator in the oncopathology unit of the Department of Pathology IPGMER SSKM Hospital Kolkata. She's got multiple publications in national and international journal with special interest in neuropathology, molecular genetics and hematopathology. With this I would request uh, Dr. Shristi Bhutta ma'am please start your lecture on miscellaneous tumors of CNS. Thank you so much. A very good evening. So today's discussion is about miscellaneous tumors of the central nervous system. So what do we plan to discuss today? We plan to discuss about the choroid plexus tumors and the pineal gland tumors per se. In the choroid plexus tumors, we will be discussing about the papillomas, the atypical papillomas and the carcinoma. In the pineal gland tumors, we will be discussing about pineocytoma, pineoplastoma and the intermediate category that is the pineal parenchymal tumor of in intermediate differentiation. We will also be briefly discussing about the brain tumor associated syndromes. So let's start. Now choroid plexus tumors. Now choroid plexus tumors basically encompasses the papilloma, the atypical papilloma and the carcinoma. Choroid plexus tumors are rare neoplasms derived from the choroid plexus epithelium, right? So as you can see here, this is uh, just a diagrammatic representation of the choroid plexus epithelium. Okay, they occur basically in the ventricle system of the brain and typically affect individuals in the first and the second decade of life. So now choroid plexus tumors are graded as grade 1, 2 and 3. They can be benign choroid plexus papillomas, atypical choroid plexus papilloma and malignant choroid plexus carcinoma. Histological classification is basically based on the architecture, that is the preservation of the papillary pattern, cellular density, cytology, nuclear pleomorphism, proliferation or mitosis, and necrosis or brain invasion. Diagnostically, CK and KI67 aid in the diagnosis. And it is important to note that these tumors typically occur in the ventricle system of the brain and cause characteristic uh, outflow obstruction of the CSF. As such, resulting in characteristic blockage of the arachnoid granulations due to tumor hemorrhage, overproduction of CSF, hydrocephalus and subsequently headache, diplopia and ataxia. Now coming to choroid plexus papilloma, as you can make out here, this is a tumor which characteristically is involving the ventricle system of the brain. This choroid plexus papilloma is basically a benign neoplasm of the central nervous system which typically has a neuroepithelial origin. These are tumors typically occurring in the first 10 years of life and the choroid plexus papilloma accounts for about less than 1% of the brain tumors in adults, 2.3% of primary intracranial tumor in children and about 3.9% of the cerebral neoplasms in infants. Previous studies have demonstrated that uh, there is a positive association of this choroid plexus tumor with BK virus, JC virus and the simian 40 virus. Other studies have also found associated germline mutation in TP53 as well as 9P duplication and hypomelanosis. So WHO classifies the choroid plexus papillomas as grade 1 choroid plexus tumor with less than 2 mitotic figures per 10 high power field. As you can make out here, there are arborizing papillae which are lined by columnar epithelium which is bland in appearance. Okay, and typically mitotic activity, necrosis and nuclear pyomorphism is lacking. Immunohistochemically, these are positive for cytokeratin, podoplanin, S100 and wimentin. So what you see here is the cytoplasmic positivity for cytokeratins or the intermediate filaments. 
Now coming to atypical choroid plexus papilloma. Atypical choroid plexus papilloma, as you can make out here, grossly uh, is a friable soft globular mass, okay, projecting into the ventricles. And it is important to note that these are highly vascular tumors. Okay. It is important further to note that they have an intermediate histology, specifically the mitotic activity, which lies between the choroid plexus papilloma and the carcinoma. The median age group is typically between 8.4 and 12 months. Okay. Although there are reports of atypical choroid plexus papillomas occurring in adults as well. So WHO classifies atypical choroid plexus papilloma as grade 2 choroid plexus tumor with about 2 to 5 mitosis per 10 high power field. Compared to choroid plexus papillomas, atypical choroid plexus papillomas demonstrate necrosis. Yeah, they have a brisk mitotic activity, about 2 to 5 mitotic figures per 10 high power field, increased cellular density and nuclear pleomorphism. These features contribute to the early metastasis which have been observed in atypical choroid plexus papillomas and microscopy reveals portions of papillary growth consisting of cuboidal to columnar cells. So as you can make out here there are arborizing papillae okay all lined by cells uh, which have a high n by c ratio typically high mitotic activity which accounts for about 2 to 5 mitotic figures per 10 high power field and positivity for Wymentin CAM 5.2 and a, and a null pattern of P53 staining as you can make out okay that is these tumors typically show all or none pattern of P53 that is they have P53 associated mutations. Coming to choroid plexus carcinomas, they are typically malignant tumors, okay, uh, and they are the ones which have been graded as WHO grade 3, okay. They have been associated with Lyfromini syndrome, which is typically associated with germline TP53 mutations. There may be uh, associated somatic TP53 mutations, and furthermore, spontaneous TP53 germline mutations have been linked to cases of choroid plexus carcinoma as well. The WHO classifies choroid plexus carcinomas as grade 3 with more than 5 mitotic figures per 10 high power field, a characteristic sheet-like growth pattern with a loss of papillary growth architecture, as you can make out here, a high mitotic activity, okay, and increased amounts of hemorrhage and necrosis. Okay, these tumors are typically positive for P53, okay, and show a characteristic uh, SMAR CB1 or INI1 and SMAR CA4 retained nuclear expression, right? Now coming to pineal gland tumors. As you can make out, pineocytoma is a WHO grade 1 tumor which typically occurs in adults in the age group of 25 to 35 years. It's a slow growing tumor and simulates a normal pineal gland okay with well differentiated cells but typically it is hypercellular the fibrovascular stroma highlights the expansile nodules or lobules of tumor cells with uniform round nuclei there is a characteristic pineocytomatous rosette that you can make out okay or a, a loose a large homerite rosette okay with central fibrillar zone surrounded by characteristic neoplastic cells okay there may be presence of neuronal differentiation as seen by ganglion cells that may be present and it has a characteristically non-infiltrative growth pattern with no or rare mitosis and no necrosis so now what is pineoblastoma pineoblastoma has a characteristic sheet like growth pattern as you can make out with a high grade or anaplastic nuclei with a high n by c ratio Okay, a uh, minimal cytoplasm and characteristic homerite or Wintersteiner, uh, Flexner Wintersteiner type of rosette. Okay, there are also characteristically a very high mitotic activity noted in a pineoblastoma, and typically it is positive for NAC, synaptophysin, and retinal S antigen. It is characteristically a WHO grade 4 tumor. Okay. So now coming to pineal parenchymal tumor of intermediate differentiation. Now these tumors fall in between the pineoblastoma and the pineocytomas. Okay, that is they are either WHO grade 2 or grade 3. 
okay they fall in between the grade 4 and the grade 1 tumor Histologically, they have a characteristic diffuse sheet-like growth pattern of small uniform cells, which are characterized by moderate to high cellularity, okay, a higher degree of nuclear atypia as compared to pineocytoma, but less than that of a pineoblastoma. There is an absence of pineocytomatous rosette, which is very characteristic of a PPTID. That means you do not see any rosette. Immunohistochemically, they are positive for synaptophysin, neuron-specific enolase, okay, and a variable positivity for neurofilament protein, chromogranin, retinal S protein, S100, and beta tubulin. So they are considered either as WHO grade 2 or grade 3 tumors, as we have discussed already, and they make up up to uh, 10 to 30 percent of the pineal parenchymal tumors. They are very cellular, but have a characteristic bland nuclear feature and lack the characteristic pineocytomatous rosettes. The survival of uh, a pineal parenchymal tumor of indeterminate differentiation is better than a pineoblastoma. Now coming to the syndromes associated with the brain tumors. Now less than 5% of the brain tumors are associated with syndromes, typically the genetic syndromes. Okay, And the red flag signs which uh, indicate that this is a syndrome associated uh, brain tumor include the multiple synchronous or metachronous tumors, rare histological variants, congenital anomalies, certain skin disorders, and clustering of certain types of cancer among family members. So coming to the syndromes that are associated, they are the Lyfromini syndrome, which is typically associated with TP53 mutation, and that has been found to be associated with medulloblastoma SHH subtype, a high, high grade gliomas and choroid plexus carcinomas. Gorlin syndrome associated with PTCH1 mutation associated with the medulloblastoma SHH subtype and meningiomas. Okay. Now, FAP, that is the familial adenomatous polyposis coli associated with APC gene mutation as seen in medulloblastoma Wnt subtype. Fanconi anemia has been associated with BRCA2 uh, and PALB2 mutations okay individuals usually have a microcephaly and it has to be noted that constitutional mismatch repair deficiency that is mlh1 msh2 msh6 pms2 has been associated with high grade gliomas and medulloblastoma rhabdoid predilection syndrome has been associated with smar cb1 and smar ca4 mutations typically in atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor meningiomas and schwannomatosis NF1, okay, neurofibromatosis type 1 associated with NF1 gene alteration in pilocytic astrocytoma. NF2, on the other hand, has been associated with meningiomas and ependymomas. Tuberous sclerosis complex, that is the TSC1 and TSH2 gene alterations have been associated with SEGA, that is subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Dicer1 mutations have been typically associated with pineoblastoma and embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosette okay it has to be noted that cowden syndrome associated with p10 alterations has been found in uh, brain hematomas mafusi syndrome associated with idh1 early mosaicism is associated with a high grade glioma typically astrocytomas so finally what are the key takeaways from today's lecture so, choroid plexus tumors can either be choroid plexus papillomas or WHO uh, grade 1 choroid plexus tumors, atypical choroid plexus papillomas or grade 2 choroid plexus tumors, and choroid plexus carcinomas, that is grade 3 choroid plexus tumors. Regarding the mitotic activity, necrosis nuclear pleomor pleomorphisms are typically absent on microscopy in a choroid plexus papilloma, which are uh, composed of uh, papillary fronds, which are lined by bland columnar epithelium. Grossly, it has a pink friable soft globular uh, architecture with irregular projections and high vascularity. 
On the other hand, atypical choroid plexus papillomas, they have necrosis, brisk mitotic activity and increased cellular density with high degree of nuclear pleomorphism as compared to the papillomas. They have papillary growth pattern lined by cuboidal to columnar cells. They also have a soft globular uh, architecture with a friable irregular projections. It must be noted that choroid plexus carcinomas have a higher degree of uh, mitotic activity, necrosis, cellular atypia, and a papillary growth pattern. The gross appearance is quite similar with characteristic invasion into the adjacent brain parenchyma. And sectioning reveals a characteristic solid uh, areas intermixed with necrotic and hemorrhagic foci. Regarding the mitotic activity, the mitotic activity is about less than two mitotic figures per 10 high power field for a choroid plexus papilloma. It is about two to five uh, mitotic figures per 10 high power field for an atypical choroid plexus papilloma. And for a choroid plexus carcinoma, it is about more than five mitotic figures per 10 high power field. Now, regarding the pineal gland tumors, they can either be pineocytomas, pineal parenchymal tumor of indeterminate differentiation, or pineoplastoma. Pineocytomas are WHO grade 1 tumors. They have a characteristic um, uh, morphology which simulates the pineal gland, normal pineal gland per se. Uh, typical imaging finding shows a well circumscribed, homogeneously enhancing mass with characteristic solid cystic growth pattern. Usually young adults after the second decade of life are affected by pineocytomas, whereas pineal parenchymal tumor of indeterminate differentiation typically affects uh, individuals in their 20s and it typically has an invasive heterogeneous uh, growth pattern. Heterogeneous enhancement and CSF seeding has been noted. These tumors can either be WHO grade 2 or grade 3. So as you can make out, they have a characteristic diffuse sheet-like growth pattern, but they lack the characteristic rosettes seen in a pineocytoma. Pineoblastoma, on the other hand, is a WHO grade 4 tumor. Imaging finding shows a characteristic poorly defined mass with peripheral calcification, okay, and it is also prone to CSF seeding. It typically occurs in the pediatric population. As you can make out, they have a characteristic uh, blastemal appearance and a rosette that is typically the pineocytomatous rosettes that are seen. So with this, I'd just like to end today. Thank you so much for your patient hearing.